am Vinay Krishna from Pingla Software and Pingla Software is a technology startup based in Bangalore. Uh, we work on cutting edge technologies like blockchain, IoT, AI ML, DevOps, cloud agnostic solutions, DevSecOps and so on. So welcome to today's webinar. Uh, as you know, the topic of today's webinar is around OKR. Uh, the topic name is uh, Enable Agile Culture Through Objective and Key Results. And today we are really glad to have with us Robert Powerman, uh, who will going to enlighten us on this topic. So uh, Rob is one of my good friends in the uh, United States. Uh, we have worked together in one of large scale transformations. It was uh, lots of learnings uh, from his side. Uh, if I have to explain him, uh, he's a really innovative, uh, like how he explains in his uh, profile also, like innovative, energetic and engaging. He's having a passion for building effective environments where people and process come together. And he's having a very rich experience in software engineering, product development, agile and lean practices, leadership and management consulting and OKR consulting to bring aligned into fast paced environments so team can focus on building and delivering great products. So uh, welcome Rob, we are really glad to have you today in this webinar. Thanks Vinay, it's, it's really great to be here. <clears throat> it was a lot of fun yeah. working with you at, uh, and I, I learned a lot from you and, and, and some of the techniques uh, that you did offer. I, I'm still using them today. They're <laughs> looking forward to getting back to Bangalore so we can do some more work together. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to focus a little bit on OKRs today. And, um, you know, I, I prefer an open environment. So if you have questions, please drop them into the chat or or we can uh, raise your hand. I'm not sure what the, uh, the best way to do this is, but we'll figure it out. Um, and uh, what I want to do is I'm going to focus in general on OKRs. Um, those are objectives and key results, <clears throat> and um, uh, but really specific to an agile transformation. I think this is a technique that can be really quite powerful for for those of you that um, are familiar with Scrum at Scale. The first step really is to establish that uh, executive action team or the EAT. Um, there's probably no better way to to uh, align a group of leaders on a, uh, an outcome than maybe an objective and key result framework, even if you don't call it objectives and key results. If you just do objectives and key results, it can make it pretty powerful. We'll go into that a little bit here. Um, they're also especially valuable, I think, in uh, lean startups. So we find that um, uh, we're working with a lot of large companies, uh, including, um, of course, Cisco and, and uh, Verizon, but we're also working in some smaller companies as well that are trying to accelerate. So these are 40 person companies, 200 person companies that, that want to double or triple their size and let's say in the next year. Um, so that's where OKRs can come into play there as well. Um, and I'll need to share my screen. I've got to, can you enable me to do that? Yes, Rob, give me a second. I'm just doing okay, cool, that. Yeah. I'll click through some slides. I'm happy to make these slides available to everybody. So, Vinay, I'll probably send them to you. And, and if you want to uh, distribute them, that's fine. And feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or if you have any questions outside of it. Yeah. So now you have agenda. Okay, great. I have to set my settings. System preferences. One second. Sorry about this. Okay, good. I may have to drop out. It looks like uh, GoTo is making me uh, bounce. Give me one second here. Okay, I think I'm back. <laughs> you may need to make me a presenter again, uh, Vinay. Yep. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Can you see my screen? Yeah, there we go. Good. Yep. yep. Wonderful. All right. So let's just jump in. Um, <clears throat> a, a little bit about us. Uh, we're the CoA Group. Um, this is a company, uh, Metro Consultancy. We, we started about a year and a half ago, and uh, we're primarily working in the United States. 
uh, but we're starting to expand. And it's wonderful to have the opportunity to talk to our colleagues in, in India and I think around the world. We've got a, a number of folks signing up on this one here, so this should be, this should be interesting. Um, so this is me and, and my co-founder, Melanie. All right, um, let's get into OKRs. Um, OKRs have been around, a little history here. OKRs have been around for a very, very long time. I think they started in 1972 at Intel. Um, to give you an idea of how far back they go. They got popular in the late 90s when uh, John Doerr basically funded Google. Um, and uh, um, that, that got them popular for a little bit. But most recently, John Doerr uh, wrote a book called Measure What Matters um, in 2018, I believe. And that, that, that reinvigorated everybody around the value of OKRs. <clears throat> The way we look at OKRs is a little bit different than uh, John Doerr in the sense that I think that the Measure What Matters book is very, very good at making the business case for OKRs, but it may be a little light on implementation. Um, some of the things that we like to bring into the discussion are some thinking by uh, Patrick Lencioni, who wrote The Advantage and uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and uh, some other some other folks out there that that do talk about alignment as as a strategic priority. So um, really, what what OKRs are is it it truly is a technique. So again, from the agile space, this is a framework. It's not a methodology. Okay, so this is an approach. It's a mindset, and it helps organizations define, align, and drive those strategic goals. So the idea is that it's not about work decomposition. It's not about execution per se. It's really about getting an organization to align on what matters most. Okay. And <clears throat> many of us may have experienced this, uh, but uh, alignment is absolutely critical to a large corporation or any corporation really. If they want to drive rapid growth um, in a in a new COVID world today, of course, um, how do we get you know, a thousand people that are now working at home to align on a common outcome. Um, so it's even more critical today uh, as we become more and more distributed. I, I think this is why in the, you know, maybe over the past five years that OKRs have started to really resonate um, is because many of us are working remotely. The teams are a lot more distributed. The technology is getting in place where we can do these things. So ensuring that people are aligned on outcome is absolutely essential. So this helps us focus on those shared priorities, is, is what this framework helps us do. And what I'm hearing from some executives over the past two to three years, Vinay, this may crack you up. Um, we've been probably talking about this for years, but getting everybody to connect to their work is central to an Agile framework, right? We wanna have everybody connected to that work. Um, this is true, especially with millennials and Gen Z, um, and OKR has helped us do that um, as we drive business value. And uh, one of the things we like to talk about is that OKRs help us shorten the correction cycle. By that, what I mean is <clears throat> if we start going sideways on our strategic goals in a given quarter or through a year, we quickly find out and can correct that. This is very much similar to, you know, even within a, a sprint burn down, if you will. If we're going flat on the sprint burn down, we, the team can correct it within the sprint. They don't wait till the end of the sprint and the retrospective to figure out that they need to fix something. They fix it right then and there. Uh, a lot of corporations today do annual or maybe quarterly planning. Um, that gives you one to four opportunities a year to course correct. Um, corporations, especially large corporations today, need to be able to make decisions faster and, and pivot more quickly. So that, that's where OKRs can help uh, in an organization. Um, this is a study that came out of MIT a couple of years ago. Um, I'll let you digest this. But the idea here is that of the companies that they surveyed, only 51% uh, of the top leadership team could articulate what the top three priorities, the top priorities were for that company. Now, that that probably isn't shocking to many of us. Um, we 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 live in this world, right? We know this. What's what's really um, Concerning, I think, is this idea of we get down to the frontline supervisors and we're down to maybe 10 to 13 percent of the organization is actually able to articulate that. And if we think about it, there might be 10 people on the executive team or hundreds, if not thousands of people at the front line. So the significant proportion of your organization is not necessarily able to articulate 
uh, what direction the company's moving in. Um, this is a leaky hose idea. Can you, can you imagine what would happen to an organization if you just doubled the number of frontline supervisors that could articulate the priorities of the company? I mean, can you imagine what that would do to the bottom line of the company? And this is what we want to start to focus on um, with the OKR framework. Um, <clears throat> another idea here, too, is that what, what OKR has helped us do is it, it not only makes, helps an organization align, but because of the data underneath the covers here, it helps make that organization accountable and teams accountable. And one of the things that I, it's, it's, it's funny to think about, but, um, we, you know, we, many of many people that I've run into that work in these environments, you know, it's like, well, we're not doing the best we could. It's not hurting us. We're just not going as fast as we could. That might be true, but what what I found actually is that if you're not aligned and holding teams accountable, it's not that it's an opportunity lost. It actually is a headwind. And if your competition has figured it out, they're going to accelerate past you. And I think that you know, we look at a time of COVID. You know, this has been a, I think, a great reckoning for many companies. And um, we're finding, at least from from our, you know, our, our short term experience in this uh, in this crisis, is that companies are kind of going two ways. Those that are leaning in, those companies that are saying, "Listen, this is happening. We do not have time to wait. We need to hold our teams accountable. Get them aligned right now, in order to make it through this crisis." And those that kind of stand back and go, "Well, let's see what happens." I my money, frankly, is on those companies that are going to lean in right now. Um, you know, there really is no time to waste when it comes to aligning an organization. And I think that if you're not aligned and holding teams accountable, that you're probably uh, facing some headwinds. All right. Um, I don't know if John F. Kennedy was an OKR coach, but you know how to write a good objective. So for many of you who may be familiar with this quote from Kennedy in 1962 about putting men on the moon. And um, this is an outcome, right? Uh, what Kennedy didn't say was, uh, I want to build a 100 meter rocket that holds 340 pound men and goes this fast, right? What he said was, go to the moon and come back alive. <laughs> That's a great outcome. And what we want to do in OKR is one of the mind pieces of or one of the shifts in mindset that we, we uh, try to help organizations understand is this idea that we want to focus on outcomes, not output. I don't care how busy teams are. I want to know what they're producing. And that is a very different mindset shift for many, many executives, right? So we're used to counting hours, counting um, uh, activity. Really, what we want to focus on is outcome. And uh, the reason why we have a hard habit of this is because most of us in our careers have been measured on our output. We're used to thinking about this. You know, I'm really busy. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what matters is what are, what are we producing? Okay. And one of the things that about anybody familiar with, uh, let's say MVOs or stretch goals some of these other goal setting frameworks, um, I'd like OKRs, especially over those other frameworks, because one of the things, if you, if you get and develop a good OKR practice and develop that mindset, it frees you from what's most probable. Um, in earlier in my career as an engineer, um, in one of the companies that I worked for, we did MBOs or management by objectives that goes back to the fifties. And, um, typically the way that worked is let's say, Vinay, let's say you're my boss <clears throat> and I'm a high performer on your team. Um, oh, sorry about the noise in the background here. Working at home. Here's, <laughs> um, it, it, Vinay, what we might do is at the beginning of the year is we might identify some goals that I would achieve over the course of the year, but it's in your best interest and my best interest that we both sandbag, that we both go for most probable, because if my bonus is tied to what I achieve, we're going to make sure that I get my bonus because you want me to stay employed and I want to stay employed. And if we can decouple activity of an individual, um, from what I'm trying to achieve, it frees us as teams, we can start to shoot for what's best possible. And even if we don't achieve what's best possible, typically victory will be far greater than what's most probable. And this is one of the, I think this is one of the superpowers of the OKR framework is that it allows organizations to do this, to really start to stretch, not hope, but to really push the limits on what teams can accomplish and, and, and achieve those results. All right.
uh, some core principles of OKRs. Radical clarity. For those folks in the room that are familiar with Agile frameworks, guess what? Same radical clarity, right? We need transparency in the organization to be able to, to communicate and to measure, okay? Um, they are fast uh, paced. And by this, I mean, what's happening is, again, many organizations, especially the top team, will be measuring on a quarterly or an annual basis. Um, we're encouraging our organizations to measure on a weekly basis, and they're doing it. These are 3,000 person organizations, $4 billion PLs. The senior leadership team is getting together every week and they're looking at the results on a weekly basis. And it's a change in mindset, but boy, does it shift the focus of an organization. And lastly, we wanna make sure that they're localized and aligned uh, within teams. Um, so this, this is not necessarily a cascade. It's, it's a way to align goals from top team to bottom team, if you will. But we also wanna use the nouns, verbs, and numbers that are familiar to that team. Um, the reason why I say that is engineering and finance use different languages. They, they just speak differently. So the idea that you have to use a business speak um, context for an engineering team is, is thrown out with OKRs. As long as there's an alignment, we should put those OKRs into the language that makes sense to us. Um, and as an example of this, when I was a young engineer, um, in my early part of my career, my uh, leadership required that I, I had a, you guys all have, I think I got a badge somewhere here. You know, everybody had their, their badges, right? And I had, um, we had to have a card on the badge which had the, the five corporate goals on it. Now I applaud the company for making that visible, but as a 25, 27 year old engineer, I had to memorize what those goals were in case the leadership uh, ended up in the elevator with me, they would ask me. And I, I don't know what year-on-year -year revenue growth means when I'm a Java developer at 25 years old. I, I, I don't care. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I remember being completely disconnected from it um, because I just had no understanding of what the company was trying to achieve. Um, if that could have been localized into my language on my team, then I would have been into it. And I think that this is something that uh, is, again, pretty powerful when it comes to, um, when it comes to, uh, uh, an OKR framework. And I just, I see a couple of, uh, a good question just came in around KPIs and OKRs. Let's get into that in a little bit here. That's a great question. <clears throat> cool. All right, so mechanics, objectives. It, an objective is a goal. It is, an, it is uh, meant to send an intent or direction. So we like to say that they're aspirational and inspirational. So these should be big ideas but not so big that you can't achieve them. They must be achievable. Typically the horizon for an objective is somewhere between maybe three months and a year and a half, depending on your company. Um, they are intended to drive, uh, communicate intent and direction. So what do we want our teams to know what direction we're moving in is the idea here. And we typically only wanna have three to five. I've had situations where uh, you know, I get the corporate goals from the company and there are 20 of them. To be honest with you, I, I can't keep a list of 20 things in my head. I have no idea what is expected of me as an employee. So we want each team to hold three to five objectives at a very high level. Um, and this helps us send signals, not noise, into our organizations, okay? Um, key results uh, are, are qualitative, I'm sorry, quantitative measures that measure the effective outcome of that objective. And they resent that best possible. So if we achieve 75% on a given KR, that could be success because again, we're shooting for what's best possible. We wanna decouple this from activities so they're not necessarily to-do lists or tasks. And typically we have four to six key results per objective, okay? This fundamentally, and I'm happy to send this out to you guys, this basically is what it takes to develop the, the guidelines around developing an OKR. Um, there's a lot of technique here, just like, this is very much like writing user stories. I can write, you know, I can show you a slide on invest user stories and it makes sense, but writing good user stories takes a little practice. Writing good OKRs also takes a little practice here. Uh, just to give you an example of this, to get a little bit aspirational, um, let's say I'm a 5K runner today and I want to run a marathon. Um, a good objective is the statement looking from the future backwards that I am now a marathoner. That's a pretty aspirational statement. If I'm only running 5K today and now I wanna run a marathon, 
That's a pretty bold statement. So while we would have four to six KRs per objective, here is an example of one KR. I just want to talk about the efficacy of that KR. So the very bottom of this list, a, a task would be, go develop a training plan. So Vinay, if I came up to you and said, I'm gonna be a marathoner, and Vinay, you said, well, what's your evidence? And I replied, I developed a training plan. You, you probably won't believe me, because that's not really good evidence that I'm actually achieving my result. That's just a training plan. Um, as we move up through this, um, there might be an indicator that I'm running on a treadmill four hours a week. It's a pretty good indicator that I might be on my way. But really the evidence here is that I've increased my miles per week from 12 to 25. That, that's, that says that I've actually changed something. Something's moved, I've moved a needle. And it's evidence, now I might get hit by a truck and not be able to run the marathon. That happens, okay? But the evidence is as I'm moving through this week on week, I'm measuring my forward progress and am I getting close to achieving that result? Am I de-risking this objective as time goes on? That is the intent here, all right? Let me just move through this. Get it here. Awesome. Uh, one thing about alignment: <clears throat> um, one team's objectives or KRs are not another team's objectives, and we don't want to necessarily cascade them down. As we move from level one to level two to level three, level one is the top team in the company. The reason why it starts there is because they're closest to strategy, and it should start there. Um, so the level one team may develop a set of OKRs make it public, level two teams will then create their own sets of objectives and key results, and they will align their objectives to the level one objectives. So if the level one, one of the level one objectives is perhaps, it could be uh, enter a new market. Maybe the engineering team, <clears throat> one of their objectives is to deliver a new, new product X that might serve this market, okay? And like having, having users on that platform. So there's an alignment approach to this, but we're not um, gonna deal with the, the KRs don't become project plans here. So it's just, we're aligning objective to objective, if you will, up through the organization. And a quick, uh, a quick idea on some best practices here. Um, again, fully transparent across the organization. Um, I promote the idea that if you have digital signage in your companies, get those level one objectives and key results and how the team is progressing on them, right? on that digital signage. I've seen this happen um, at Cisco and other companies where quite literally the level one team achievement is shown every five minutes. It's a great way to send that signal. Let's be really transparent. Um, KRs, again, do not become another team's objectives. They're different entities. Um, and that's really the reason why. We like to talk about the double espresso and the melatonin rules. Um, <clears throat> double espresso is an idea that gets you up in the morning. Um, so we want to have something that might inspire that team a little bit. Melatonin, things that help you sleep at night. So I come out of security. Um, I, I usually am more worried about making sure that I sleep at night as opposed to uh, getting up in the morning. Um, use your threshold for success. And by this, I mean, Google recommends that you maybe achieve uh, OKRs at 60, 70%. Um, that takes a lot of discipline. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're a little bit more risk averse, you might want to say that your achievement is at 90%, so you get closer to that mark, um, maybe a little bit less ambigu ambiguity. Um, we want to decouple these things from individual performance. This blows a lot of teams away, um, but the idea is that there are many ways to do performance management in organizations as a manager. I don't need to use OKRs to manage my people. And again, I think that the idea is that we want to have OKRs belong to a team, not to an individual. Because again, we want to make sure that we reinstill that concept of team, the power of team, in the same way that in a sprint, we don't want to assign a user story to an individual. It's the team that owns those user stories, not the individual that owns that user story. All right? We want the team to swarm on all of the objectives. And we want to make sure that we don't turn this into a task list. And that, that could take a little bit of uh, the technique as well. Um, I think that's about it. I'm not going to worry about the launch cycle. That's where we are on the slides. Let me back up a little bit here and see if I can answer some of these questions that are coming in. Um, when it comes to KPIs and OKRs, um, okay, good. It looks like we may have cleared it up. Um, just to clarify for the wider audience, what's the difference between a KPI and a KR? Um, very often, your key results may come from KPIs. 
Um, and it's not one or the other. A lot of organizations say, okay, well, we have to throw away all of our KPIs and just measure KRs now. That's not true. Um, the KRs are the evidence that you're achieving your overall objectives, so they support that. But there are plenty of KPIs that you should measure as a business that may not be aligned to your overall strategic goals. So for example, let's say you're a relatively healthy organization, um, retention of your people is not so much a concern. You have, you know, you have a 5% turnover every year, and that's, um, and uh, you, you wanna turn over your people maybe every 5% a year, that's, you're comfortable with that, there aren't any problems. You should measure your turnover as a KPI, but it might not show up as a KR. So as one example there on the difference between KPIs and OKRs, very often you'll have a leadership dashboard that might have a whole bunch of KPIs on it, financial ones, people ones, but your OKRs are really measuring how are we achieving our core objectives as a company. And that's, that's one of the differences. And thank you for the reminder, Melanie. Very often we wanna to try to look at leading indicators as much as we can. It's, not, it's impossible to do all leading indicators. Let me give you an example of a lagging indicator. Um, revenue can be a lagging indicator. Right, so if your KR is, you know, generate, you know, X dollars of revenue, well, if that if if that number isn't coming in until a month later, so let's say we find out what our April revenue is now, it's not something I can move the needle on. It's already happened in the past, so there might be other indicators. Perhaps NPS might be a better indicator of future um, future revenue, or measuring something in accounts receivable. But we want to try to focus on leading indicators as opposed to lagging ones, because the intent here is not to beat people up if they don't achieve the key results. Um, what the intent here is, is uh, we like to say that we like to lean into the red. When you see red objectives or red OKRs, that's a signal for the leadership team to look into this and say, how can I help? Okay, how can I help solve this problem? That's the, that is the, uh, that is the intent. So um, those leading indicators can help us move the needle. If something's going sideways, we wanna fix it now, not wait till the end of the quarter to fix it. All right, uh, let's see now, a couple more questions coming in. I hope that answers the, uh, the question there on OKRs and KPIs. There's a great um, article which we can send out to you which differentiates these things. How do you align OKRs to ethics, et cetera, so product owners are able to align their vision to those common goals? Great, great question. Um, this hasn't been articulated too well out in the world yet. We're building some theories on this. In my mind and in a nutshell, OKRs are an alignment framework that is different than how you manage your portfolio or do lean portfolio management. So if we're doing lean portfolio management or program level agility, you know, as I develop my epics, I think there's a loose coupling between the strategic goals or the objectives and the portfolio or the ethics. So for example, let's say there's a very high level objective, which is enter a new market. The portfolio, as, as a leader, I, don't, I shouldn't care how that gets done. It could be a build or buy decision. If it's a build decision, then engineering is gonna probably have some objectives about building products that will help us enter that new market. If it's a buy decision, then my finance team is probably out there looking for, and, and my product team is out there looking for uh, an acquisition that we can go buy to enter that new market. Very, very different activity, but the outcome is the same. We've achieved this result of entering a new market. So I think there's a loose coupling between your objectives and key results and your portfolio. You might use frameworks like design thinking to drive those portfolio items. So for example, how might we enter market X and then use that as an exercise to derive those ethics in your, uh, in your, in your backlog, if you will. So that's, that's how I kind of see it. The KRs measure how well we're, we're, we're achieving those results. Sometimes, I mean, there are ways, there are platforms out there like Workboard that will allow you to, for example, measure the number of stories in an epic. And sometimes that's a good indicator, um, but really it should be a loose coupling between your alignment framework and your lean portfolio. I hope that answers that question. Oh, thank you, Melanie, for dropping in the article on KPIs versus OKRs in the chat. That's great. How to practice writing OKRs. Yes, there is some good information out there. We can send out a quick link to um, 
maybe Melanie, we can send out that some example OKRs off of the uh, workboard site there. Um, it, it is an art. It is an art to writing these things. Um, and it, it takes a little, uh, as, as we do a, a one day OKR coaching class that we can you know, teach some of these techniques. We do some, we, we have some fun exercises around how to uh, develop good OKRs or how to critique bad ones, if you will. And, and there really aren't good or bad. It's really more about effective and ineffective OKRs. Um, so what we can do is we can get some of that material out there to you so you can see some examples of good OKRs. Um, this is a very generic example. Uh, thank you, Melanie, for putting that out there. Um, as an example of, you know, you, you want to question each other. So if there's some very activity-based, um, you know, uh, key result, you might challenge each other and say, hey, listen, you know, that's, a, that's just activity. That's not really producing uh, an outcome. All right. How do you know when your org is mature, ready enough to define OKRs as it will require a certain level of maturity at the top? This is a great question. Um, very much like an agile transformation. I'm going to be really blunt, though. OKR transformations are much easier than agile transformations. And part of it is that the OKR framework is simpler, but it's also something that everybody in the org connect, can connect to. There still is a lot of bias out there that agile frameworks are purely an engineering thing. We all know they're not at this point, but there still is that idea out there. OKRs are seen as a business context, so it's a little bit easier. I would argue though, that if you have an executive team that doesn't find value in alignment, this would be a hard sell. Um, I think John Doerr's book does a very good job of making the business case for alignment. Um, and I think that there are a number of ways, you're welcome to use some of these slides and some of the data here. So for example, I think, I think this piece of data here can be very important to uh, a leadership team because they all know this is happening as well. So making the case that, listen, we can do a lot more with what we have by bringing in an, uh, a, uh, an OKR framework is, is uh, a powerful argument. Um, it is hard, though. It is hard to get everybody to align. But once they lean in, um, they start executing. And from there, then, you can move on to some kind of an agile transformation. But um, there is a certain level of maturity that an organization needs to have. That there has to be some decent functioning communication at the top. If you have a truly toxic environment, this is probably not going to work very well. But, but uh, honestly, those people don't ask for OKRs. So, uh, let's see now. We have a framework for the company level, multi-year goals, annual goals, and quarterly input goals, and outcome metrics. This is very, very common. Um, most organizations have annual or multi-year goals. Um, I'm going to argue that those typically are not very effective because they're not measured. Um, they're usually measured at the end of the quarter. Um, it depends on the org, so I, I'm not so, Raju, I'm not sure what the, uh, what, what, you know, your specific situation is, I'm happy to talk about it, but in my experience, when I've seen these multi-year goals at the very highest level, what ends up happening is, and I had, a, I had a situation with a client where it went exactly like this, I was doing an OKR coaching session for a second level team, up, and it was basically, there were, I think we had about 30 senior directors and directors in the room that we were working on an alignment framework. The reason why they wanted to go to OKRs was because they recognized that in the previous year, they had set out these goals in the previous year and they achieved 40% of what they had hoped to achieve. This is in an 800 person organization, okay? So the leadership knew they only achieved 40% and they were looking at OKRs because they wanted to achieve more than 40%. <laughs> like maybe they should achieve 100% of their goal. We spent two days at an offsite with about with these 30 people trying to come up with a set of OKRs. They were having a really hard time aligning. There's a lot of chaos in this organization, so it's, it was natural. We got to the end of the session, and um, they hadn't achieved, they hadn't aligned on a set of OKRs. And I challenged the group. I said, listen, they, they said they would come back in three to four weeks and maybe try this again. And I asked them, I said, listen, you have 800 people in your organization. You're achieving 40% of your goals. That means that 60% of your people are wasting their time every day. You have 480 people in your organization every single day wasting their time. I said, I propose you get in here on Monday and figure it out. Now, I was surprised, but they did. So they, they, they decided at that point that they needed to make this decision as soon as possible and start measuring on a weekly basis. 
Because measuring quarterly, you have 520 hours a quarter to work. That's what we all have. If we're working 40 hours a week, uh, 40 hours a week, it's 520 hours. What I'm asking leadership teams to do is to take four of those hours and align up front their organization and then measure that on a weekly basis. Otherwise, you're going to get to the end of the quarter and you're going to achieve a lot less than you hope to achieve. So I think that really the idea is to try to reduce that correction cycle and try to drive the idea that multi-year goals, I mean, heck, most people spend less than two years in their job. So some of those goals might not even, they might be a whole new company by the time you achieve those goals. So it's important to focus on what's happening right now. I, I hope I answered that question. Um, let's see now. How do you measure productivity based on OKRs as many waterfall top execs always look for such, uh, yes. Be careful in metrics. Uh, any measure, uh, a measurement is a tool. It can be used as a weapon. Um, I think OKRs work perfectly well in a waterfall framework. I, I'm not anti-waterfall. I, I think that waterfall has its place as long as it's empirical and disciplined, it can work. Um, so really OKRs are a way to, uh, to measure outcomes, whether you're doing waterfall or agile or whatever. Um, I think they lend themselves better to an agile organization because if, if we need to pivot mid quarter on something, because that's what the data is telling us we need to do then my teams are ready to pivot as well. Um, if I'm working waterfall, then I might start to actually set stakeholder expectation and, and try to de-risk the program. So it, it is helpful to do that. But in any situation, if you have executives that are using metrics as weapons, um, it's, gonna, it's not gonna go well. So that, that is something to watch out for here. Um, let's see now, tracking them for the company is becoming a challenge right now. Will the OKR framework help be helpful in tracking the company, le company level? Yes. Um, really, what we like to do is track OKRs transparently top to bottom in the organization. So typically we start with um, typically we start with the level one objectives and then level twos, level threes, level fours. And we had an experience uh, with a client, um, 3,000 people in the organization. And we did one level one team, of course. I think there were 16 level two teams. And the executives decided that they wanted to do an all hands where they read out their objectives for the quarter that they were gonna attack. And um, they were able to visualize the connections between objectives, between level twos and level one. They were able to identify the dependencies between teams. And it was the first time that this organization had ever visualized the interconnectedness between the goals that each of these teams was trying to produce. And it, it absolutely just blew everybody away to have that kind of transparency and visibility into the organization. So, you know, basically those dependencies exist in your organizations right now. You just may not be able to see them. So being able to see that by using an OKR framework, for example, can be incredibly powerful to help leadership um, understand where they need to add resources, where they need to reprioritize, or even where they need to pivot. All right. So any more questions? We're kind of, let's see now. So projects running under a common program have common cares to measure successful delivery. Uh, that's pretty typical as you move down level twos, level threes. What ends up happening? So the question again, how do you tie your alignment framework or your OKRs to your portfolio? It's typically not level one objectives that are driving your portfolio. It's going to be level twos and level threes. So uh, what ends up happening is you might have a level three objective, which is, you know, develop a new, we, we, we've developed a, a, a competing platform in SpaceX or something to that effect. And um, what's going to end up happening is that that program is going to have localized languages around their KRs. Um, so yes, you will end up seeing localization happen, not only in the objective language, but also in the measurements. And ideally KRs, because they're a measurement of success, um, typically, I, I would recommend that as much as you can automate the tracking of these things, the better off you are. Um, so, you know, let the data tell you where you are. Let the data tell you where you are. Uh, don't let it be open for interpretation. The data says where we are. If, this, if the data says that we're here, we don't like it, well, then let's go do something about it. So, it, but it is necessary for everybody within that team to understand um, the language of those KRs. If I'm being measured on something I don't understand, it's, it's very hard for me to, um, to address it. Let's see now, projects running under a common program could have, oh, yep. So would not measuring weekly get difficult challenging if we intend to provide more freedom to people to bring innovation with what they do? 
Usually teams to come to pressure and focus more activities when we have measure weekly. Any thoughts on how we can better do this? Yes, this is a challenge. So the question really is, when people are measured, they might innovate less. I don't think that that's necessarily true. It's only true if you have a culture that's set up that way. So um, again, we wanna make sure that we put measures in place that are measuring not the individual activity of people, but the outcome. So if the outcome requires a highly innovative solution, then we might find KRs that measure that level of innovation, for example. So for example, let's say we wanted to really innovate and um, see what might be possible as we develop new products for a, for a new market. Um, rather than measure the number of user stories that people are closing on this innovation program, you might wanna measure, I don't know, the number of, uh, uh, you know, perhaps the number of uh, webinars that the product team has done in meetups in that space, right? It, it, it can enable the innovation as well because people know where they are so I don't think that measuring weekly gets in the way of innovation unless it's inefficient, okay? If it's inefficient, then it's gonna get in the way, just like anything else. So, you know, the, the argument could be, for any of you that drive cars, um, you know, is, would it happen if I, you know, take your, the dashboard of your car, which shows how fast you're going and, and your windscreen and everything else. Let's just say every, every 10 seconds, I turn everything black for five seconds. How's that gonna go, right? Is less measurement better? Um, probably not, you might miss something. So I'm gonna argue that more measurement is gonna be better to a point, but it needs to be low friction. We don't want that measurement to cause people um, pain. Now, when you measure people, you will change their behavior. This is good. Because if I know how I'm being measured and I'm being measured to innovate, then I'm gonna go innovate. But if I'm gonna get beaten up because I'm taking time to think about how to, you know, innovation takes time, um, if I'm gonna get beaten up for that, then I'm not going to. But, you know, for example, an organization might set up perhaps an innovation budget to some extent, and that might be something that they measure, okay? Um, one way to measure innovation is number of patents. You know, over the course of maybe a quarter, we wanna have 10 patent submissions or something that in fact might be a way to do this. Okay, let's see now. Um, how to adopt OKRs at the company level across the board to ensure people follow uh, religiously. Yeah, it, it's very important that OKRs are launched across the organization. Typically, the best way to do that <clears throat> is to start at the top. I think that, you know, maybe 20 years ago, agile transformations could have been done grassroots and um, you would, uh, you know, engineering organizations could do agile and then, you know, they would spin up and, and everybody else would adapt. <clears throat> OKRs really need to start pretty much at the top. It's not uncommon for us to start at a level two team to experiment with it, and then it gets adopted at the level one and then moves out through the entire organization. Um, it also could work in a space where you have a lot of command and control. So for example, if you have you know, a VP of engineering who really has control of that organization, he or she might choose to do OKRs to make sure that that organization at least is aligned, even if the leadership chooses not to be. Um, but it really is important as much as possible to get this across the organization because we really do want everybody focusing on what the company goals are you know people shouldn't be working on things that are not aligned to the company goals period and i don't think that gets in the way of innovation if the company has decided they don't want to innovate and you want to i'm going to be really blunt you should go find another company to work for you're not working for the company that you should work for so it's and if you feel that there's an opportunity to innovate um then okrs provide that communication to leadership where you can actually communicate that up and say hey listen we don't do innovation here we should probably start to do that uh, let me give you an example of this we were working with a team where uh it was a level one um and they had eight level two teams um and the level one team came up with their four objectives and the level two teams came up with their objectives six of those eight teams came up with an objective that was about culture it was about people because this was a company that was growing very quickly they wanted to retain their culture it was very important to each of these teams those teams couldn't align that people objective to anything at the level one because nothing existed so i simply went back to the general manager and said you guys need to have a people objective at level one because your teams are asking for it and they looked at it and said duh yeah we should have one 
So the level one team came back, created their own objective about, this is the place that people come and stay. It was basically the gist of their objective. And then everybody else was able to align to that. So the teams, the level two teams were actually the ones that drove that level one objective. So there, you do want to have that transparency across the organization so that people can provide feedback. Let's see now, can all objectives and key results be measured? Maybe uh, not. For example, increase client satisfaction or support sales team with pre-sales activities to win business. This is a great question. Um, everything should, all care should be measurable because we want to make sure that the objectives are achievable. Let me give an example of a bad objective or an ineffective objective. Be secure. Right. Uh, as a security guy, you're never secure. Or the product is usable, right? That, that's a very subjective kind of a thing. So really, to, in this increased client satisfaction, uh, the way I would coach that for an, as an objective, let's say you have a challenge in your organization where your clients just aren't happy. Maybe your NPS score is down at you know, 20, okay? And you really want to focus and send a signal to the organization that our, our customers matter. You might have an objective, which is that our customers matter most, right? And that's a statement. Looking back in the future, you know, that would be a proud thing for me to say. Our customers matter most. And the KRs that might go into that might be things like, you know, if let's say you're able to do NPS scores on each interaction. So like you, you close out with a client, ask them for an NPS or, you know, a, a net promoter score, and they fill it out. I'd want to see a trend upwards from 20 to 40 maybe uh, this quarter on our NPS score. Um, maybe one of the things you're measuring there is, is time to resolution. Or uh, let's say the problem is that you're, you don't have enough service reps. And, um, you know, the time to resolution is four hours, whereas it should be 20 minutes. So there, there are ways to measure this. But if we put this into a statement, looking from the future backwards, what have we achieved? That's one way to do this. I, I hope that answers the question, uh, Arun. Um, any recommendations on number of levels where OKRs can be written in an organization? Um, it's interesting. I uh, Definitely, you want to start at the top. And I don't, I, I would argue that it would be ideal for OKRs to go all the way down to the frontline teams. Um, there is an argument that could be made, though, that maybe you don't go all the way down, because as you get deeper into the organization, you're getting more tactical, okay? And the OKRs and your product backlog start to look more and more the same as you get deeper into the organization. But one way to look at it, for those of you that are Scrum people, you can imagine, like today when we do a, when we do a sprint planning, um, one of the recommended practices is that the team identifies a sprint goal. We, we bring in our user stories, we look at the totality of those user stories, and we derive a sprint goal from that. I want you to imagine a situation where you do OKRs top to bottom in the organization, and even that frontline engineering team has a set of OKRs. Those OKRs were probably very tactical. They might be about code improvement, they might be about cross-training, they might be about delighting customers. But instead of looking at my user stories and figuring out what my sprint goal is, how about if I walk into my sprint planning with my sprint goal that's aligned to my OKRs, and then I pick the stories to drive that sprint goal, turning it completely around. Um, and uh, so there, there are ways to look at this going deep into the organization. Um, some organizations in our experience with our larger organizations, typically they go down to level three, level four, maybe they're six, they have six layers in the organization. Um, and then they leave it up to the teams to decide if they want to do OKRs deeper in the org. Um, there are many, many different ways to approach this. All right. So some, such carries are pushed down from our top management. That's when it becomes difficult to manage. Yes. So the idea here on OKRs is not, here are the executive OKRs, now go do it. That is not the idea behind OKRs. Um, again, this is not Kennedy saying, go build a rocket ship that's 120 feet tall, right? Yeah, the idea is that we're going to trust these empowered teams to understand what they need to do. They just need to know where to go. So OKRs are about the why and the what. Let's let the, let's let the teams go figure out the how. And this is why OKR framework is very similar to an agile framework for engineering teams. Um, and it just is that we're bringing in product and sales and support and all these other organizations. But it is not a top-down dictation. We don't cascade these things down. We, we want to push the decision-making as deep into the organization as we can. 
and for teams to make good decisions on their daily work, they need to know what the goals of the organization are. And if we can give them that, then they're going to build the right things that we need to uh, that we need to build. They're going to start to build the right things because they know where the organization wants to go. Now, with that kind of autonomy in an organization, can that go bad? Of course it can. But to be honest with you, I think today in 2020, we all know that command and control systems across multiple geos, across multiple languages, across multiple uh, countries, and so forth, like. The, the, the idea that there's one person in a corner office telling everybody what to do, those days are, that is 20th century thinking. In the 21st century, we're going to have to trust these teams and we need to give them the information they need, including the strategic direction the organization is moving in so that they can make the right decisions. And then I want information, instrumentation coming up from those organizations on achievement of goal so that I know as a leader what I need to do in order to enable that organization. I hope that answers that. I love talking to executives about this stuff, by the way. Their eyes just get wide. Five, three, five years ago, this washed over a lot of executives. Today, this is starting to resonate. It's, it's becoming quite popular. I, I would argue that John Doerr's book has done a lot for OKRs. Um, I think he re-raised, I think he hit the timing on it perfectly. The world was ready to hear about OKRs in 2018 and it is especially ready to hear about it in 2020. Um, as a fair warning, um, OKR practice is just like an agile practice. We usually recommend to our clients that you'll take two to three iterations, does this sound familiar, before you get good at it. Um, and that usually means, because the cycle times on these things are quarterly, uh, it usually takes two to three quarters for a, for a large organization to kind of start to feel comfortable in doing their OKRs but it's amazing to see what happens when they do get there. So there is, this is just like in, in Scrum, Kanban, Safe, Nexus, any of the frameworks that you've used before, you have some basic knowledge, but it's gonna take some practice to develop that knowledge into skill and into expertise. So it's not a matter of just reading a book and, and making it happen any more than you can uh, read a book on, you can read the uh, Scrum guide and just make that happen at scale. You know, there is some technique here that makes this work. But uh, it is intrinsically simple. Do you have a question? All right. Today we're coming up close to the top yeah. of the hour. Are there other questions or is there anything else? I'm wanna... just trying to get. Guys, uh, if you have any more questions, we have some more time. Uh, yep. And that we can utilize. So there is one question from Pramod now, uh, Rob. Okay. Look at these questions here now. Ah, okay, great. So up to what, up to what level upwards should lower level look for OKR alignment? Great question. So basically, how do you how do you level up, if you will? Um, so for example, lower level technology teams not set up as value streams may not always be able to to align to business objectives. So this sounds very much like a, like if you're looking at developing safe value streams, this is a very, very good question. Let me show you how this works. I'll get into this a little bit more. You should typically, a team's objectives should level up to the team above it. We, we call this the team hierarchy inside of the CoA group. It's not an org chart. It's how do the teams line up? So typically, you know, you might have a, 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 a VP of engineering that runs the engineering organization but there might be smaller lines of business within that engineering group, so for example. But typically, objectives level up one level. Sometimes they might skip level to two, but, um, but we do want to make that connection visible. So one of the attributes of an OKR that Melanie and I try to describe inside the CoA group is that the aligns to is a necessary attribute of an OKR. So basically, what, does, what objective does this objective align to? Um, there is also dependencies. So an objective might depend upon another objective as well. We probably want to call that out as well. So you can get a fairly complicated mapping in, in pretty short order, but but in, in the end of the day, we do want to have visible this the, the aligns to hierarchy of OKRs. So you would not often see a frontline level six engineering team align their objective to a level one. There's just too much abstraction. 
you know, because when we're higher in the organization, we're dealing more with a strategy. As we're deeper into the organization, we're dealing more with tactical ideas. It's not right or wrong. It just is the way it works. So it's much easier to kind of uh, level up as you go through. But that said, as an engineer on an engineering team at the front line with a set of OK OKRs, I should be able to trace up my objective, my, my team's objective, to my boss's team's objectives, to my boss's boss's team's objectives, to my boss's 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 team's objectives, right up to the top of the company. I should be able to see how my work is aligned to the overall work of the organization, but I should be able to see that in a language that makes sense to me. That, I hope that answers it, Pramod. Okay, so we are very close to end of uh, this webinar. We have, uh, uh, if anyone is having a last chance to ask any question to Rob here in this webinar, otherwise uh, you have to reach out to him through LinkedIn and other ways to get your queries answered. And if not, then yes, of course, uh, as we have seen that, that uh, how it is going to make a difference when we are going for a uh, kind of transformation whether we are naming it as like agile large scale and what framework we are going to use but this is going to complement that entire transformation in a right way so and uh, one more thing which uh, uh, rob has mentioned like it requires lots of practice because that's the way we can just be able to uh, write the good okrs for uh, and then various labels right so I hope uh, this uh, webinar has answered your queries and also ignited within you like, okay, learn something more and be good in at your end. So I would like to thank all of you who have joined today uh, for this webinar. And I would like to thank Rob a lot because he has found a complete one hour time for us and uh, yes, excited to uh, look at like in future, we can have such webinar more and more with him also. Uh, we have some more uh, webinars aligned for upcoming weeks. So you guys are always welcome to be part of that. Okay. So yeah, with this, I would like to close this webinar session now. And thanks to all of you once again. Thank you very much. Thank it was you. wonderful. Thanks a lot. Great questions, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.